mental health is is a interesting concept because a, a lot of people think of it in terms of very black and white terms so you either have mental health uh, problems or, or issues or you or you don't and actually um, you know through my experience I've come to I, I also used to see it in that way and through my experience I've come to see it in a very different way so if you I imagine it like on a continuum Hello, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Hibba Bassett. Now, Hibba is a CBT therapist and she works for the NHS. Um, she works with interpretations, helping people to understand their thinking patterns and behavioral patterns. Uh, through developing this understanding, she supports others to shift these patterns from unhelpful to helpful and from automatic to rational. Her work uh, involves facing your fears, uh, testing your health assumptions and beliefs and developing self-compassion. Hiba is also a writer. Her debut novel, The Tightrope, uh, came out earlier this year. Her book is uh, based around her experiences of working within the mental health field. Uh, Hiba addresses important concepts in a no novel, including these, or including those of faith and choice, uh, predictive thinking and belief systems. With everything going on in the world right now, mental health cases are on the arise. Uh, so I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to interview uh, Hibba, uh, someone who works in a mental health field. And if you are going through uh, hardships right now, if you're going through issues, mental health issues right now, uh, please do listen to this interview. I'm pretty sure she will help you in some way because she carries so much knowledge and wisdom. Hey Hibba, how are you doing today? Hi Madiha, I'm good, thank you. And how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Loving the sunshine we're having at the moment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the last of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last bit of it. Um, I was just thinking back how we actually met because uh, you're a family friend, so family of a family friend, so, so some sort of far circle of family friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I'm not exactly sure, but I know my mum and your mum are family friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I spoke to you briefly like years ago, um, about I think about 10 years ago over the phone. And at that time, you were actually doing the uh psychology so you were studying psychology and I, was, I remember asking you so many questions regarding that and yeah you was like this girl's like asking me too many questions I was like I'm suffering from this like tell me what what this is <laughs> yeah I think I was doing I was studying psychology actually yeah back back when I was a, a uni undergraduate gosh it feels like a lifetime ago <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, um, obviously our listeners don't know who you are and I know who you are. So why don't you tell uh, them a bit about yourself, a brief overview of who you are and what you do? Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm a, currently a CBT therapist, which stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I've been working in the mental health field for about, I'd say it's coming up to, well, I haven't thought about this, but nine, nine years now <laughs> <laughs> when I graduated in 2011. Um, so um, yeah, so I did my degree in, in BSc psychology. And uh, after that, I uh, worked as a clinical researcher um, in a chronic pain trial. Um, so I was um, researching chronic pain and uh, working um, on the psychology and physiotherapy arms there. And uh, then I went into working in a psychiatric ward, um, an adolescent psychiatric ward for, for a year. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I got introduced to CBT. And mm -hmm. uh, for about the past, I think, six years now, um, mm -hmm. I've been working in the, in the CBT field as well. Um, 
Yeah. So, so also, um, you know, psychology is quite, quite broad. So as, as you probably can tell, I'm a, a um, Asian, so I'm British Asian and, uh, um, in psychology we uh one of my interests has been diversity so i've actually mm -hmm. uh, ran a pilot trial to look at treatment outcomes for ethnic minority groups um mm -hmm. and uh, been working quite a bit in terms of that field as well but currently cbt therapists hoping to go further into trauma work um, yeah. yeah so you know you mentioned you know uh coming from a asian background you know did you face any challenges growing up uh, being british asian in the uk oh as a british asian um yeah i can i can think of a few for myself um that's that's a uh, uh, kind of pop up in my mind. Uh, so really kind of that the, the two cultures are uh, like the British culture and the Asian culture. My experience of it, at least I can't, I can't make general statements, but my experience of it is that they're quite different um, and quite contrasting. So I remember being um, in school and actually the Asian culture really teaches you about um, collectivism and uh, submissiveness and agreeableness uh, those qualities are really important in in that culture because they enhance um they enhance relationships they enhance uh, care for others whereas um well at school i was kind of encouraged to be more more assertive and more independent and it was completely unfamiliar to me this mm. this idea of being independent um so there was a lot of uh, difficulty getting that trait out and um, using uh, those traits in in day-to-day uh, -day life really and I think that's kind of carried on into into adulthood as well in the work environment where assertiveness is really really important I think and kind of gets people to higher levels of um, their jobs and their roles so mm -hmm. um, I've had to learn assertiveness training and uh, how to be assertive because it's not readily taught in, in our culture. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I think, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know if everyone, every uh, Asian or British Asian has experienced this, but I had my fair share of experiencing racism when I was young. And I remember particular, the first time I ever experienced it um, was when I was 14 years old and I was just uh, coming back from, uh, shopping or seeing a friend I can't remember now and uh, as I was walking off the bus this woman um, called me a packy and uh, I just remember that experience being a real a real kind of uh, not instantly life-changing but actually the months that followed um, quite life-changing because I uh, it's odd to say this now thinking about it but I associated I didn't realize I was Asian and Pakistani as much as other people did um I was very familiar with the British culture having grown up in this country mm. and born here um really familiarized myself with the white culture more um mm. white British culture more um, and so when she called me a Paki, I thought, huh? Um, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I am. I am from uh, my heritage is Pakistani. Um, so it was a real um, shock in mm. that moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think it really changed how my identity in the coming months and years, really. Mm. And uh, I initially before that incident I readily identified with the white British culture mm. whereas actually when someone calls you a packy you kind of think oh I'm not immediately accepted by this culture mm. so you have to then question where your identity lies mm. and so you know I think although in that moment it was really shocking actually it allowed me to accept a bit more of the uh, Asian culture that um, I came from mm. so um, although I'm not thankful to her for being racist to me because I n will never be thankful to anyone being racist to others because it's not a nice experience I do appreciate how it's uh, shaped my identity today mm. as well mm. yeah. so you know it's I think it's it's uh, 
it's the same case with like you know if you are uh, if you know I I'm not personally very religious I'm I'm spiritual but not religious but you know quite a lot of people just see me as oh are you Muslim or are you this because I'm brown so they automatically assume that so you know but I live by the I'm more of a British sort of I live the more of British culture myself so I totally understand where you're coming from and yeah so you know you said you're associated more with obviously British culture and um, did it like have an impact on uh, any any of your relationships with your family or friends? Oh, definitely, yes, and I and I think it would really, um, because I think you know, like I said, I I did readily accept the white British culture and I kind of shunned the Asian culture. But it, I'm being truly honest here, um, mm. and it's because um, religion was. Um, I felt quite pressured to be religious when I was young. And what happened is as a child, you don't really know the difference between religion, culture, ethnicity, nationality. Mm. They all just merge into one, you know, as you're learning about the world. Mm. So because I didn't, um, I felt pressured with religion, I lumped them all into one definition and shunned all of it, basically. Mm. And so naturally that's going to have a, an effect on uh, my family really because um, you know they moved from Pakistan to England and now I appreciate the sacrifices that they made to to move here actually leaving their country but their heritage as well and then seeing a daughter grow up very white British um, and completely shunning her own culture so there was definitely a lot of conflict <laughs> <laughs> when we were young <laughs> and uh, I think I didn't um, I didn't really appreciate uh, the the kind of my home culture um, until that moment when I was called a Paki and I had to almost kind of um, you know think about my identity a bit more um, and think actually why have I readily familiarised myself with the white British culture and immediately shunned the Asian culture mm. um, in the same way with school I think it with friendships. Uh, it's difficult because you know other girls would be allowed to stay over would be allowed to kind of go out um later than usual whereas actually at home we were encouraged to spend more time with their family look after our elders and that was really valuable so you can you can't do both really you can't go out you know with your friends and do sleepovers and at the same time look, look after your elders and spend time with the family so the the contrast was uh, it was contrasting it was different and unfortunately because the the difference was contrary it meant that it clashed a lot and so mm. you know we had a lot of clashes with with family and with friends as mm. I was trying to place my identity where it kind of sat yeah. yeah, I think I can totally relate to that. Well. And then I'm sure many British Asian or any any anyone who's from a different background can understand that. You know, um, it's uh, it's I found it um, in a way like you know I was clashing with my own family a lot because I was embracing the British culture and my family were just still. I feel like they were like backdated in their own culture, sort of in a sense. You know, going back in like thousand years or something like that. So. You know, living in a modern times, and whereas they they still have that mindset of very, um, is it religion and plus culture mixed in, and it was it was kind of hard to interact with, um, the elders in the family. So it, eventually, you know, they do kind of accept. It's all about acceptance, isn't it? It's so you kind of uh, you kind of, um. Uh, bring yourself in a middle ground for both of you so you you can do you accept okay this is how she is and say like, okay this is how they are where we can find some sort of middle ground eventually yeah I think that's such a good point about acceptance and I mm -hmm. think it works both ways and you know you we as the um, you know, kind of recent generate current generation have to accept that these were values that are very traditional and very important to our parents and ancestors, as well as kind of acknowledging that we wouldn't want them to change, but we can't 
if we don't want to implement them, we, we don't have to. And mm. that's when the parents to accept that actually, if they're going to bring up a child in a very modern English country, then that child is going to be aware of things that maybe they wouldn't have been aware of if they were brought up in Pakistan mm. and to accept that there's going to be change there as well. So yeah. I think acceptance is uh, the re- a really nice and honest word there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And also, and also think that, um, you know, like going back into your uh, generational line, um, someone has to break it at some point. You know, if we are living in the same sort of pattern over and over again, it's like it's passed on to generations and someone needs to break it. So someone needs to be that rebellious sort of thing. No, I'm going my my separate way. So it becomes like, oh my God, she's going a separate way. Yes, rebelliousness was a constant, (laughs) much to the dismay of my parents, (laughs) but they've accepted it. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously you said you're a CBT therapist. Uh, What made you become a CBT therapist? Like, were you, did you experience like mental health issues yourself? Um, Yeah, yes, I did. Um, So... Mental health is is an interesting concept because a, a lot of people think of it in terms of very black and white terms. So you either have mental health uh, problems or, or issues, or you or you don't. And actually, um, you know, through my experience, I've come to. I I also used to see it in that way, and through my experience, I've come to see it in a very different way. So if you, I imagine it like on a continuum. So you've got like a, you've got the lower end, you've got the higher end and uh, you've got an anchor on the continuum. And that anchor, if it's in the middle, that's a really balanced mental health. But that Mm -hmm. anchor has the ability to shift either kind of upwards to even optimum mental health or downwards to uh, poor mental health, which means that a person might be experiencing mental health problems. Mm. So we're all susceptible to mental health problems. And yes, my anchor has shifted lots <laughs> in, <laughs> throughout my life. Uh, yeah. And uh, some periods um, where it's shifted more to the lower end. And uh, yeah, I've experienced um, more, more so depression throughout my life um, mm. on and off. And um it's uh yeah it's been the i think the it's been i think the first time i experienced it when i was actually 15 years old i remember it being high school time around that time mm. um and not really knowing what's going on what, mm. what's happening um and then uh experienced it really kind of <clears throat> at university after work and then the most recent time was about 6 years ago um mm. where yeah, my, my mood dropped and um, experiencing, yeah, depression. Did you, uh, do you, like, you know, obviously we just discussed about a different culture, background and everything. Do you think that that, that played its part? Because, you know, obviously you're, you're in a family, you want to be accepted, you want to be part of the family and that sort of thing. Um, do you think that um, having differences with your family, not feeling connected uh, kind of... Um, made you go down in the depressive sort of pattern I think um I think it's about for me it was more about the experiencing two different identities Mm. with what we've been talking about with culture so we've Mm. got two different culture identities before someone has even gone to university really so before Mm. they've even started to develop their own almost you know, other identities like career identity, social identity, um, personal identity, mm. and trying to fit into both identities and please both the Asian culture and the the, the white British culture is incredibly difficult. Uh, mm. At least I found it uh, mm. incredibly difficult. Um, and so it definitely had an impact uh, in terms of um, just being able to feel confident in in who who you are and what you stand for, but on top of that, not being able to then share what you're going through with mm. the people around you, that can leave you feeling very isolated. Mm. So no doubt, I think that that then has an impact on the way you then cope with 
difficult situations that are thrown at you mm, yeah i can totally uh, understand that um um so you know obviously cbt uh what is uh cbt a uh, cbt cbt <laughs> what is cbt now it, it has a different like it has a, a longer version but i prefer to say cbt because i <laughs> said some of the things like today i can't remember the full version of it. but yeah what is cbt like can you explain it to the listeners who have no idea what 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 it is um yeah um, so yeah, CBT is what it's um, known for now. That's the kind of acronym. And uh, it's, um, so I got introduced to CBT in 2014, um, when actually I uh, went to have CBT myself. Um, and that's the first time I actually found out about it. Um, and um, CBT is basically uh, it's it's the most kind of widely known treatment for common mental health problems uh, so we're talking about depression and all types of anxiety disorders such as generalized anxiety um, social anxiety panic disorder um, going to obsessive compulsive disorder health anxiety um, PTSD so that's what it treats a really wide range of problems that affect people day to day mm. um, and cbt is the way i understand it is that um, we all we all have a mind right i'm using my mind to talk to you you're using your mind to listen and to respond back um, people are listening to this podcast are using their mind to process the information to make sense of it so when we go about our day-to-day -day lives what happens is that this mind is constantly active hmm. and uh, this mind makes interpretations about everything that happens to us. Yeah. Hmm. These interpretations um, are basically how we think about a given situation. Yeah. Now, um, how we think about a situation it doesn't just stop there because how we think affects how we feel emotionally mm. about that situation and in that given moment, how our body feels, and then how we actually behave or respond in that situation. Mm. So um, I could use an example to explain if that might help. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a funny example. It's, uh, it's about dog poo. Um, so <laughs> very much uh, CBT related. <laughs> um, so if you imagine kind of, you know, um, three houses lined next to each other with three doors and three different people walk out of the three doors. Okay. But they all, they're all walking, uh, um, on the path and they step in dog poo, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got person A walking out of their house and person A's interpretation of stepping in dog poo is oh my god i can't believe that uh, the dog owner left the dog poo purposefully on my path how dare how dare they how dare the dog poo on my path mm. yeah this is going to make a person feel this interpretation is going to make a person feel most likely very angry or frustrated mm. Mm. Now the body's immediately going to realize this emotion and start responding to the anger and frustration by either um, getting really kind of tense, the heart racing. And that person is most likely going to try and find that dog owner or the dog or be very kind of annoyed at people in general in the workplace. Or maybe next time they see a dog, they'll be like, oh, yeah, see, look, look at that dog owner and be very kind of hostile towards all dog owners. Yes, so that's person A. Okay. So we've just seen how an interpretation has changed their emotion, physical symptoms and behavior. Mm. We've got person B who steps into that, dog poo same situation but their interpretation is oh why me why mm. does this always <laughs> happen to me uh, my my future is hopeless because bad things are always going to happen to me mm. this sounds like a 
uh, an, uh, an interpretation that's most likely going to make that person feel very upset, very sad, very hopeless. Mm. That body is going to respond to that emotion, maybe kind of sat down a bit, shoulders hunched, you know, deflated, mm. uh, no energy. And that person is most likely then in the day not going to do much, mm. as little as the body can manage, really. Mm. You've got person C and who steps into the dog food and thinks, oh my gosh, lucky I was wearing <laughs> shoes because if I wasn't, if I was barefoot, this would have been a worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, they literally clean their shoes, are so happy with the incident because they're not barefoot, right? They're going to feel neutral, if not positive, that they were wearing shoes. Mm. Their body's going to be lifted, energetic, probably no change in their body, definitely not any unhelpful changes. Mm. And their behavior is probably going to be carry on as normal. Or maybe kind of they might think, actually, I'll share this with one of my colleagues and interact a bit more, you know. Mm. So this is um, the underlying basis of CBT is we really look at four areas, the interpretation, mm. the cognitions, the emotions, the physical symptoms and the behavior to see how they connect really with each other. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, yeah, it's amazing because, you know, I uh, when you mentioned about the victim mentality, so the person B was a completely you know, victim right. mentality. It was like, why is it happening to me? Why me? Or was yeah. this, that, and the other? So, you know, um, I remember like when I was suffering from anxiety and depression, you know, severe anxiety, depression, I was constantly that person, a person, uh, it, person B why is it happening to me why is life against me why this and my shoulders it's it's so true my shoulders was always like you know I was always cramped up I was never body language it's only when I started doing public speaking uh we started to learn about uh you know like body languages and before you go onto the stage you stand in a, like a superhero pose um and it's such it makes such a difference because if we, we tested this on the stage where we sat and um cramped up like you know it's a sort of like you know and it, it, we felt the energy of that anxiety coming in immediately whereas we stood with our like superhero superman pose and you know we felt so confident and we did so well on the stage as well at that time so it's, it was a nice bit of an experiment um so you know I'll, I'll get back to the victim mentality afterwards but there's something that i you know obviously i want to ask you before that is uh, how do you work with your clients you know given the dog poo and <laughs> the, <laughs> the situation how do you work with them so um that's really the first thing that we do is we have we have a model called a um five areas model is it's by Pedeski, mm -hmm. um and uh, it has the four areas that I've mentioned in a circle and it has the situation outside of the circle and that's really important because mm. anyone coming to CBT um, I'm, I make it very clear as a therapist that mm. I have no power over a situation mm. happening mm. to you you know if it's going to rain I cannot stop the rain if you're going to step in dog poo unless I see you just about you know before you've stepped into it once yeah. you've stepped into it i can't change that situation for you mm -hmm. but what you can change is you can change how you respond to any given situation mm -hmm. and that's quite empowering i think for clients um, to know that uh, what they've been trying to do is change the situation mm -hmm. whereas actually they need to look inwards to see how they can change how they respond to any given situation mm. so something we really focus on is identifying um their patterns of thinking and how mm. these patterns have a knock-on effect on the other three areas mm. and once we've got a pattern of thinking the next question is to identify is this pattern unhelpful for you or mm. helpful and if it is unhelpful then we actually work to implement change in that mm. pattern and to see if implementing change um, helps with their overall mood. Um, but I think at the, at the crux of CBT, because it's, it's not just talking, 
it's very active and the client usually does about 95 percent of the work mm. um, because a lot of the therapy happens outside of the session when they go away and live their day-to-day -day life so in order to actually um you know take a lot of responsibility for that therapy they need to come in with or at least be ready to uh, try to change their responses if they if they feel it's helpful unhelpful sorry mm -hmm. so they need to have this willingness to create change um and have a mindset that allows motivates them to create change rather than be stuck in a, a like you said a, a victim mentality mindset mm. so yeah yeah the, yeah one yeah. of the things we do is assess that and see actually are you ready for change asking them what would you like to see in therapy what change would you like to see you know because it comes from them and they're entirely in charge of their own therapy at the end of the day yeah, that's beautifully said. I mean, it's do you have to be willing to do the work yourself? Otherwise, there's no point in having uh, th any therapy sessions, you know, yeah. uh, and that's something that I learned myself over the years when I was in and out of counseling. Actually, I've, I've only had CBT twice, but it's, so it's a recent thing that's come through, hasn't it? So over the last 10 years, um, yeah. I've had quite a lot of counseling and they, they would give me things to do but I wasn't willing to do do it I was I was still in that victim mentality it was like oh it's not gonna work anyway it's not gonna do da, da, da. so it was it's all it, like you said it always comes back to you have to put in the hard work only you can save yourself no one else can do it for you they can point you in a direction but you have to do the work um so you know going back to the victim mentality like i said i was in that for several years and i'm sure quite a lot of our listeners would be uh, would be uh, they are now or would have been um so how can they step outside of the victim mentality what can they do what are the steps that they can take to step outside of the victim mentality yeah i guess uh i guess it's the well there's no change without awareness. Mm. And so if someone's not aware that they're in that mentality, then they're not going to be able to change it. You know, mm. it, it sounds obvious, but a lot of people are not, are not aware that they're uh, constantly in that victim mentality mindset. So a victim mentality mindset uh, sounds something along the lines of, like you said, person B, why me? Why does this happen to me? I have no control, um, things are never going to get better, um, the future is going to be as bad as today. As you can hear, it really has this kind of mindset and theme of things are happening to me mm. and I am not in control or responsible for anything happening. Mm. Um, and I myself was in this mindset uh, pre-2014, which is why I kept on dipping in and out of um, experiencing depression because um, that mindset leads to negative thinking. It leads to hopeless thinking about your future. So I can only talk from my experience really in that, first of all, I had to become aware of how often I was saying things like, oh, this is happening to me. Um, mm. Even if it rained, why does it rain? Why, why is it a bad day when I need to go out? Yeah. <laughs> and then you hear yourself and you think, oh my gosh. <laughs> so the first thing is uh, to be aware and, and to be honest with yourself mm. and not in a, not in a horrible way. You mm. know, I, I kind of said to myself, oh gosh, Hibba, you're, you're really playing the victim card here as to things are happening to you, but do you have any control over um, what happens or maybe how you approach it? Mm. The minute I asked myself that question, I realized that I was giving up a lot of control. And so that's when I decided that I didn't want to stay in that mindset. Um, I think a lot of people might stay in that mindset because it does have its benefits. For example, you get empathy, you get uh, social support, you get pity, you um, uh, get kind of people caring for you, checking in. And I think all of those em empathy, checking in, support, they're really good 
um, outcomes. But I'm wondering if that could be those outcomes could be accessed in a different way. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that's a primary need, social support, empathy. But actually, could the behavior be different to access those same needs? So you asked me, Medea, you know, how do you actually get out of that victim mentality? And really, it's hard to change cognitions but it's easier, I'm not saying easy, but it's easier to look at our habits and our behaviors. Mm. So it's about thinking, what's the behavior that's maintaining this victim mentality? For example, for me, um, was something that really maintained victim mentality was I would um, cancel on my uh, you know, plans um, because I didn't want to go and I thought, oh, I'm feeling so bad. I'm going to make everyone else feel bad and then they won't have a good time. Hmm. But then afterwards think, oh, poor me, that I didn't get to go to this. <laughs> and actually the opposite of that is, you know what, go and communicate hmm. what you're feeling hmm. and listen to other people's responses. Give them a chance to respond and then make a decision whether you want to avoid going to your plans mm. or go in the end. Mm. So that's, a, that's a, how a, I experienced a behavioral change. So I would really encourage people to think about their behaviors that are really manifesting this victim mentality and look at ways to help themselves get out of this mentality. Because like you said, no one else is going to help you really get out of it. You need to help yourself and you're halfway there. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. I know. I think I read somewhere that um, it takes, uh, if you want to change a habit, it takes about 66 days to form a new habit. Um, uh, yeah, it's 66, not 21 days that, like a lot of people think. It actually takes 66 days to actually emb embody it in your uh, subconscious mind. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That's not surprising because habits, if you think, are so entrenched that if you need to form a new habit, you need to give it time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anything that I do, so if I'm starting like my self-love, self-care affirmations, like I'm enough or I'm this, that and the other, I do it for 66 days at least. So I, it's, it's, it's ready drilled into my subconscious mind. And sometimes even go a hundred days. It's like, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> well done you, my dear. That's, that's amazing. That's, yeah. that's commitment in, in itself. And, um, there's something you said there that just made me think of, uh, um like psychological muscles mm. um as you said it takes what 66 days yeah did you say yes yeah to form a habit and something that um you know everyone should be aware of is this idea of practice so a lot of people with psychological therapy try something once and it doesn't go well and they're like oh yeah no that that didn't help. And actually, if we think about physiotherapy, which so many people are aware of, right? No stigma with physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if we think about physio, if the physio said, if you broke your arm and the physio said, right, you need to implement these exercises at home. And uh, when you come back in three weeks, let's see if your uh, muscles increased. And that person only does that exercise once. Hmm. things are not going to improve no. you know there, there's going to be no no increase in muscle strength mm -hmm. and it's the same with um with our mind we have psychological muscles inside our mind that we don't see but we feel emotionally mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so if you're using a technique to you know increase a psychological muscle be it that self-love or self-care or um, disengaging from negative thinking actually practice 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 because you don't see it building but you will definitely um, increase the chances of it building with practice yeah yeah, yeah that's... you just make it you think of that as like a habit yeah. yeah yeah and I think a lot of us are listeners and you know will dive into that and they probably already know about this but this when I tell people this about 66 days they are like what it only takes like seven days I was like no man you have to really <laughs> drill it in your subconscious mind you can't just like oh just give up after after a week like oh I tried the new diet why do you think most people 
don't like form that sort of habit when they're you know when they go through the um new year's rev- resolution thing oh i'm gonna i'm gonna do exercise and they do it for like a month and then they give up that's like 30 days that's not 66 days you need to do it for 66 days um so yeah so in order to form a new habit yeah it's 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 mind-blowing isn't it it's you have to do a lot of research on these things if you want to improve yourself you need to do a lot of research on these things and implement it on yourself um so you know going back to uh negative self-talk like you know i know when i was suffering from anxiety and i'm sure a lot of our listeners uh would be in the same place where we we struggle to think positively and you know we constantly bring in ourselves ourselves down it's like i'm not good enough the self-worth issues i'm not worthy um i'm i'm hopeless and you know these kind of things so you know how how does like a negative self-talk impact our relationships um, with sorry. ourselves sorry uh, with ourselves I was... yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well it impacts relationships it impacts a relationship with yourself and that 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 is the most important relationship the relationship mm-hmm. you have with yourself yeah um, so self-talk is, is an interesting one because we're, we're very we're very much aware of how we speak to uh the people around us mm. how we speak to friends how we speak to our parents how we speak to our siblings to children to teachers to colleagues right we're so aware of how we do that but when someone asks you how do you speak to yourself everyone's like oh uh, i don't <laughs> oh, to myself <laughs> And the thing is, we all do it. Even if you, you're sitting there and you're thinking, nah, I don't speak to myself. You do. <laughs> I can guarantee you that you speak to yourself at some point. <laughs> and so it's really important to think, okay, when we talk to other people, it has an effect on them in, mm-hmm. in whatever way we talk to them. So mm-hmm. it will have an effect on us. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we all want to help ourselves right so we need to then think okay what kind of self-talk is going to help us out Mm. and there's there's really three types of self-talk um so uh the easiest way i can explain it is using another example this time not dog poo this time just (laughs) getting out of bed in the morning (laughs) um imagine someone's had a really busy day uh, the day before um, the next day, you know, they, they're really not feeling uh, up to it. They're feeling really exhausted, really tired um, and really low, to be honest. Their mood's not great. Their motivation's not great. But they do have things that they need to crack on with. Yeah. So we've got kind of, a, a, you know, voice A, a self-critical voice, okay, which will probably sound something like this oh I'm, I'm so such an idiot i'm so stupid for doing lots of things yesterday now look at me it's 10 o'clock i can't even get up yeah and now let me ask you does that sound like it's going to get that person out of bed no <laughs> i'll probably pull the covers over me <laughs> just to get rid of that voice <laughs> and now we've got uh, voice uh, b um, a passive voice which is, uh, don't worry, you can stay in bed for, for however long you want. Yeah. Is that going to get the person out of bed? Get in there. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a bit kinder, but, but still not, still not yeah. actually telling you to stay in bed. <laughs> so um, the, the voice C is really kind of the voice that we want to aim for. And that's what we call in CBT um, and actually in, in compassionate focus therapy, a, a self-compassionate voice. And so that sounds something like, look, I know it's hard for you to get out of bed right now because you're extremely tired. Um, but you do know that the longer you stay in bed, the harder it's going to be. And then when you do get up, you are going to feel pretty low because half of the day is going to have gone and you're not going to have got much done. Mm. So I know it's hard, but is there any way that you could at least try? Mm. Now that's, that's a very different voice. And Mm. you know, the chances are that that person is going to get out of bed quicker than with voice A and B. Mm. And so this is just a, a really, um, you know, 
a random example of how to how to use it compassionate mm. one. a lot yeah. of people who um where the where the anchor goes to the lower end and mm. um who experience mental health problems they have a very self-critical voice unfortunately yeah, yeah. Um, and the self-critical voice uh, makes situations for them worse day to day mm. and actually creates a very negative bias in their mind uh, mm. where they actually then can't can't rationally see a situation um mm. or what it what it is um mm. and so it has a very very distressing effect on how someone feels day to day but then how someone feels about themselves as a person mm. which you know self-esteem issues depression anxiety etc yeah so you know it's just a bit like what you focus on grows um and you know if uh, people are familiar with law of attraction of the secret they watch the secret if you haven't guys watch the secret um they uh your focus is such a yeah it's a focus is such a um, important point so if you're focusing on the negative uh like li- a negative way of thinking you are going to manifest a lot of negative things in your life um you know so you know how can people focus on positive a- aspects um in their life you know if they're in a in a rut where they're all constantly uh you know constantly in a negative self talk and and they they can't see the light at the end, end of the end of the tunnel how can they shift their mindset to positive thinking mm. um so earlier on i was actually talking about uh, psychological muscles and one of our psychological muscles is the muscle of, of attention so mm. an attention muscle um so attention is simply what you place your focus on so right now uh you know i hope my attention is as much on on you and what you're saying um if it was elsewhere for example um i've turned my phone off so i can really attend to you but if if i left my phone on and it started beeping my attention would get pulled onto mm. the phone mm. and it would make it difficult probably i would struggle to talk to you and listen to you so attention is something we all have but we don't use very wisely mm. um for example someone might go out for a walk to get away from a situation maybe an argument with with their with their mum or dad but as they're going on on their walk they're thinking about that argument mm. and so they've kind of packed up the argument with them taken it on a walk with them then they come back and people ask them how was the walk and they're like nah nah still feeling really bad mm. well of course <laughs> <laughs> of course because you've linked arms with the argument and you've thought about it so much so you've basically carried it along with you mm. and that unfortunately doesn't help them to focus on what uh, the positive aspects of what a walk could have brought for them you mm. know for example was it a nice day did they notice the sun you know the warmth of the sun did someone smile at them that they missed could they have helped someone out but they didn't notice because they mm. were too in their thoughts mm. and so attention is one of the simplest ways to focus on something positive try and not you know um ruminate over a negative outcome or a negative situation if you're with your friends really attend to your friends leave your phone leave your problems unless you're talking about your problems for the sake of a solution or to vent which we're all allowed to do you know mm, yeah. in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> but really attend to what's in front of you mm. and so maybe doing some attention training or present moment focus training could really help you to recognize when you're carrying your anxious depressive thoughts with you like a rucksack and you're carrying the weight of them which means that when you go for a walk or when you go for a night out with your friends or when you're reading a book you're not really enjoying the positive emotions that activity could bring because you've packed up your thoughts mm. so really be aware of where your attention is where you're placing your attention and if your attention is being pulled onto your thoughts um and you don't want it to be practice some attention training to get it out in the environment don't keep it in 
get it out in the environment, practice that and we should help. Yeah, I totally, totally. You just said it beautifully there. I, I, you know, it's it's amazing. And another word that kept popping up is living in the present moment. Uh, and we don't do that enough. You know, we're always worried about, oh, what's, uh, what's going to happen next? What's happened in the past? And what just happened? Like you had, like you said, you just had an argument and you're just going away and thinking about it. It's happened in the past. Let's just yeah. try and live in the, <laughs> the present moment. And we don't do that enough. And, you know, I, I often find that whenever I'm in nature, it's uh, it's so amazing because nature is always in present moment. There's nothing, you know, there's no uh, past, future, whatever. It's always in the present moment. And, you know, you can, there's another way you can do things is where obviously you said like taking away your phones and, you know, um, and sit and in the present moment, look at the grass, like what is the wind doing the, to the grass and what is the trees and what the birds are doing. And that's where you need to be at constantly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And now that I've been practicing attention training for so long, mm. I actually have ways of living that has changed, you know, with my family and my friends, um, especially with my friends, we put our phones away. Mm. And when we're actually talking to each other, we are 100% focused. That kind of interaction, it's, it's amazing. You leave that interaction is really really nice and yeah. we're even with family or friends i i'm very aware of if i have a problem why am i communicating this problem to my friends and family am i just dwelling on it mm. and do i need to dwell on it do i need to vent if the answer is yes i time limit myself so mm. that i'm not spending the whole interaction dwelling yeah. on it yeah. Am I am I talking about it because I'm looking for a solution and I'm with a person who can give me that solution? Or am I talking about it because I want to reflect on how it's made me feel and maybe if it happened again, how should I change that? Mm. But I definitely don't just talk about it for the sake of talking about it because mm. it's in the past, it's happened. And actually, there is so much more to focus attention mm. on. Yeah, yeah. And I, you made a, such a great point. Uh, regarding your phones everywhere you go people have their phones out you know in restaurants or everywhere else and I, I'm even guilty of that because you know everyone's doing it it's like okay why don't I do it so, but you know <laughs> keeping your phone away when you're interacting with another human being is there's no feeling like it you know uh, it's it's you need you know, we make a deeper connection with the other person and you are listening to them because so oftentimes when they, when I'm speaking to someone and they, they're looking at their phone and then look, and I'm like, I'm just like, like, you know, giving all of, all of my problems to you and I'm just sharing my problems to you and you're like looking at the phone. Oh, yeah, I'm listening. You know, right. you're halfway listening. <laughs> and, you know, that's such a, that, that experience, I'm sure so so many people can relate to because essentially and essentially to me if someone did that essentially what that person is saying is I would rather be talking to someone else or attending to something else rather than sit here and interact with you mm. and there have been so many people who consistently did this in my life we had chats about it they didn't get it they are now out of my life <laughs> for yeah. reasons <laughs> it's just not a nice thing to do and no. I don't think people intend to do it but mm. I think it does come across as actually you are not as important as the person who's just whatsapped me or yeah. the video that I'm suddenly watching on YouTube yeah. it's kind of it's kind of become an addiction isn't it with also social media and everything it's easier to get in that um even you know you're like something pops up of a, or a tv show or something and you're, you you don't make that same interaction with people and and you know even with relationships people the relationships nowadays are quite fragile and I, I and I would say that like openly because you know like I said, there's so many other distractions out there, even romantic relationship, friend relations. There's so many d distractions out there. You don't focus on one thing. You focus on several different talking to 10 different people at the same time, you know. Um, so there's no heart to heart connection anymore. That's what I feel. So I only keep people who who I connect with deeply on a deeper level. Um, 
And it's it's great that you you you've done the same, you know, getting um get, I like I always say getting rid of tox toxic people. Not they don't it's not like they're toxic, but getting rid of people who are not uh, helping you to grow is is another way you can you can in, improve your mental health. You know. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think you can always have a discussion if something's bothering you. But actually, if there's if that that discussion is not leading to any change, then you're kind of getting a signal that actually what you, what your what's what's affecting you is not important. So you do then need to question whether that relationship is, is uh, you know is um, worthwhile useful helpful mm. Mm. Um, and and that might sound harsh to some people but actually if you're not going to put yourself first who who else is totally agree with that totally agree now um i have uh, heard of a term be behavioral activation <laughs> so can you i i don't know what it is because I, I heard of it i was like i don't know what it is so can you tell us a bit about that you know yeah, so behavior activation, or we call it BA for, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So it's actually one of the treatment techniques for uh, working with people experiencing depression. Um, and uh, I actually think that it should be a worldwide technique for everyone mm -hmm. because um, currently uh, I'm not experiencing depression, but I still use that technique. Mm. Um, so the the underlying um, point, the, the kind of theme of behavior activation is this idea that um, a lot of people mistakenly um, have this belief that uh, if they are suffering from motivational issues, then they need to wait for the motivation to come Mm. before they do something mm. and the problem with that is that that motivation might never come and that low level of motivation might become more entrenched over time and mm. therefore make it even harder to start doing things mm. and so there was a lot of research uh, conducted with regards to this belief and um, the research concluded that that's not actually the true relationship. Mm. Um, actually, the relationship is, is that you need to activate yourself mm. and the motivation follows after. Mm. And so a lot of people follow their mood. Mm. I'm low, therefore I'm not going to go for a walk. I don't feel very good today. Therefore, I'm going to cancel the plans I had with my friends. Mm. Or, oh, I'm feeling so stressed. Therefore, um, I'm not going to uh, sit down and have a cup of tea and, and take some time out. Mm. A lot of people follow their mood. Mm. And what we found is that when people follow their mood, they're more likely to develop mental health problems. Mm. And so really what we emphasize with behavior activation is um, we give people a diary to find out how often they're following their mood and we mm. find that they're following it a lot leading to the trap of negative thinking and low motivation so we actually get them to plan and schedule their week before it even comes mm. um, so that they don't have a chance to say oh but I don't feel that good therefore I won't do anything they've already got a plan they have mm. to do it yeah and this idea of activation first and motivation follows and what we find is that when people start to activate themselves doing what they enjoy so pleasure such an important thing pleasure but also achievement something that helps them feel like they've succeeded in something achieved it these two particular types of activities actually improve mood significantly before you've even done any of the cognitive work this is just behavioral change. And so they start to develop this belief then, ah, okay, motivation doesn't come before activation. Activation mm. comes before motivation. So that's oh, the that's brilliant. Motivation of BA is, yeah. Wow, that is amazing. You're learning so many awesome things today. <laughs> <laughs> next time if you ever think oh, I, can't, I don't want to do it you think no, no activate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's amazing, Hiba. Like, I don't really want this interview to end, to be honest. <laughs> But unfortunately, we're coming to an end. Um, so, you, what is, um, you know, one final question. What is the one message that you would like to uh, share with someone who's going through adversity right now, who, who is suffering with uh, the mental health? What is that one message would you tell them? Um... I have two. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Go for it. Even if you have 10, go for it. <laughs> okay. No, I, I do have 10, but I won't put you through that. <laughs> Maybe so, we need to get you on another podcast and then <laughs> you can explain those 10 tips. <laughs> I was anxious enough about this one. <laughs> one last time. <laughs> so um, I think the first thing I would really emphasize is monitor every thought that goes through your mind or if you can't do every, which I know sounds hard, um, monitor as many thoughts as you can that go through your mind. Because our thoughts, what we think, for example, this podcast went really well, this podcast didn't go well. Both are thoughts, hmm. but both are opinions. So if we know that thoughts are opinions and we stop taking our thoughts as facts, they have less, the negative thoughts have less of a chance to cause distress. Mm -hmm. So that's really the first thing. Really, really monitor every thought and question it and challenge it. And the second thing would be something that I think has been helpful to me throughout my whole life is surround yourself with people who lift you up. You know? Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My friends and family mean the world to me and mm -hmm. I think if you have those people who lift you up surround yourself with them if you don't have those people I would encourage you to find those people go and do activities that are social mm -hmm. um, or do activities that bring you what socializing could bring you connectedness or warmth uh, positivity self-love because um, there are so many activities out there in the world that have the potential to bring that. So those will be my top two. That is amazing. And I, I think we need definitely need to get you on another podcast and explain the other 10 <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, hey, but before we go, I uh, forgot to mention that you have a book out. You like, uh, that's, 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 you, 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 you failed to tell me about this. <laughs> oh, by the way, you know, I just launched a book. <laughs> so, can you tell us about, uh, about this book, please? Yeah, of course. So, um, so it's called the tightrope, um, and uh, it's on it's on Amazon now. I, I launched it uh, early this year, and um, it's really about my um, experience uh, of working in a mental health field, but particularly with one of my clients. Um, and uh, it's uh, I wanted to write something that made people aware of um interpretations really mm. um and this idea of how um it, it's a very uh, so actually it's a very um cultural belief so we in a, in our culture we uh, say something uh, around nazu i think you might know about oh it. evil eye i've actually got like a the crystal i'm wearing that right right, <laughs> right. yeah evil eye and yeah. um, or kind of uh, nuzzo mm -hmm. and uh, I was really interested in this because I believe it myself mm -hmm. and yet in um, the psychological workplace people were like oh but how does that actually work logically and I was like oh my gosh I don't know <laughs> <laughs> and so I really wanted to explore this idea of how people might believe in fate Mm -hmm. And people might believe in this kind of very doomed, hopeless fate. Mm -hmm. And how that is that depressive thinking? Is that more cultural belief? Mm -hmm. So I wrote about my experience of um, working with uh, a, a young girl during my time um, in working in mental health and how her um, belief system really shaped 
her behavior and her future, basically her day-to-day -day life. Um, and uh, how a psychologist was working with her who had a very different belief system. Mm. Um, so it's really kind of the portrayal of two very different belief systems, how they clash, but actually how they could potentially complement each other. Mm. Um, and I wanted people to question their own belief systems. Mm. And that's really kind of why I, I wrote that book um, to help people become aware of what their own belief systems are and how that, their belief systems are having an impact on their day-to-day -day life, but more importantly, their future and what, what it could look like. Um, oh, that's amazing, guys. So where is where's this book? Where is, is it on Amazon? So, yeah, it's on Amazon. So if you, if you type in the tightrope um, and you type in my name, so Hibba Bassett, it should come up. Um, yeah guys yeah. get that book out i'm gonna get it. she she only just mentioned it i was like what <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna be i definitely gonna be she's gonna be sending the book to me <laughs> I will do. I will do. <laughs> yeah so get that book guys um so is there any way uh people can contact you or uh well currently i uh, work for the nhs mm -hmm. um so something that I, uh, and this is people are finding out more about it but you know um, whoever's listening this will be a great way to get people even more familiarized is there there is a service called um, IAPT and it stands mm -hmm. for improving access to psychological therapies now it's only been a decade I think it was um, really kind of hit off in 2011 and the service was created um, because it um, you know the there was a realization that a lot of people sometimes weren't severe enough in experiencing mental health problems to be admitted onto a psychiatric ward, but mm. still weren't functioning day to day mm. to not receive any support. So this is a community service. Um, mm. If you type in IAPT and your local borough, there are IAPT services all over your local borough. I work for um, the Richmond Wellbeing Service. Mm. So that would be the service for people living in Twickenham, Richmond, etc. Um, but if you type your borough and IAPT in, that is the um, service then you can access the support from. Um, and um, yeah, if you want to get in contact with our service, then you can type in the Richmond Wellbeing Service for people living in that borough. Yeah. Okay, amazing, amazing. Huh. So, <laughs> coming to an end now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hiba, uh, for coming on this podcast. And, you know, your knowledge, is, I'm sure, is going to help so many people. And I've learned so many new things, you know, even even if I, when I was going through in and out of counseling and all these, like, like everything, um, it's I, there were certain points I didn't understand myself until now, and I'm sure it will help quite a lot of people who are in the same boat. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, coming um, on the on the podcast. Uh, is there any last message that you would like to say? No, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to talk, and uh, I guess that's the aim, isn't it? Even if it helps one person, if not more, then that is my job done. <laughs> so that's really good, um, and I think it's amazing that you're doing this podcast yourself, and uh, I can't wait to hear everyone else's interviews um, as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.